7.30 p.m. Good evening, I'm Shubhi Lin on News 5 tonight. Singapore's central bank maintains a conservative economic outlook and expects inflation to stay elevated. A historic day in Myanmar as the UN chief becomes the first foreign dignitary to address parliament. Also, relief as Aung San Suu Kyi decides to debut in the house this week. Video emerges in Malaysia showing Anwar Ibrahim apparently instigating the Bursay 3.0 chaos. They are normally in, in a pack, you know, the few dogs at a time. And a humane solution to a stray dog problem in Ang Mo Kyo. Singapore's central bank is sticking to its projection of modest economic growth this year, that is 1 to 3 percent. This is despite the surprise rebound in the first quarter. Giving its half-yearly macroeconomic review, MAS says it also expects inflation to stay elevated but ease slightly in the later part of the year. MAS says Singapore's growth is expected to come mainly from the services sectors this year. This as trade-related activity, particularly in the electronics sector, will remain sluggish. So now manufacturers are trying to restock their inventories and that has lead, uh, led to a surge in production uh, for the electronics industry, which has actually uh, lifted overall manufacturing as well as headline GDP growth in the first quarter of this year. But we don't think that will be uh, sustained into the second quarter. We think some uh, degree of pullback is possible. While economists don't expect a repeat of the strong growth in the first quarter, they see growth firming up from the second half of the year on. MAS also expects headline inflation to remain high this year before easing. For instance, car prices may trend higher in anticipation of a tighter supply of certificates of entitlements this year. If the COE numbers were to run the way it is running, and if there is no major shock uh, to our economy, then I really would not be surprised if the luxury car series cross the 100,000 mark. And for the uh, small cars, uh, they will probably cross the 65, 70,000 mark. Besides cars, housing rents have also surged, partly due to a supply shortfall. For companies, this will be compounded by higher labour costs as they adjust to a tight labour market. For those who are more labour intensive and particularly dependent on blue-collar foreign workers, um, that will bear the brunt of the transition clearly. And the transition could be longer and more stark. Uh, for more knowledge intensive operations, which account for the bulk of you know, the corporates based here, in the M, certainly in the M and C space, I think the adjustment would be less. Most private sector economists are forecasting the economy to grow more than 3% this year, close to the upper end of MAS's estimates. Well, inflation will average 3.5% to 4.5% for the full year, according to MAS. And core inflation, which excludes housing and cars, will range between 25 and 3%. But one economist says there's no need to be too worried just yet, even though MPs we spoke to say their constituents are feeling the effects. Soaring COE and property prices, two main factors that caused inflation to rise 5.2% last month. Though figures for services and food remained relatively stable, some members of parliament say residents are already feeling the pinch. Rentals across the board have gone up, whether it's for commercial, for coffee shop, uh, for any other retail outlets, and all of these have added to the cost of the business owners, who have then passed on the cost to ordinary Singaporeans. To ease the burden, Mr Singh has proposed that the government offer some help. In the past, uh, when we had uh, GST increases, uh, and that led to cost uh, increases uh, for Singaporeans, and government actually came in with a package to help them, uh, it's no different right now. Uh, costs have gone up. Uh, with uh, no uh, short-term uh, solution for wage increases. Uh, and so it uh, will be good if the government can step in to help address some of the cost increases so that at least some of the basic needs of Singaporeans are taken care of. But analysts say it might be a bit too early to get worried over the March inflation figure of 5.2%. We should not unduly worry for just one month's figure. Uh, over the years, uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore is still predicting inflation to be around 3.5%. So much is, is uh, one spike in the uh, CPI figures. In terms of food and services, it remained quite stable at 3%. 
and uh, even three percent, of course, is still high compared to what it used to be. Uh, say a few years ago, which was at two percent. Professor Tan says while all Singaporeans will feel the effect of inflation, the middle to high income group will be affected the most. And fewer jobs were created in the first quarter of this year. The Manpower Ministry's latest estimate is 27,400. That's down from the previous quarter and compared to the same time last year. Economists say Singapore has passed the peak of its economic recovery. But MOM says the job market remains fairly strong. And some recruiters think the government may reconsider recent curbs on skilled foreign manpower. Well, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong has made another urgent call for the country to raise productivity. He said it's the only way to sustain better wages as Singapore faces domestic constraints. Besides an uncertain external economic environment, Singapore is also facing domestic pressures that will slow the country's growth to between 1 and 3 percent this year. Mr Lee said Singapore is running up against land and manpower limits. The move to cut back on foreign labour may cause some companies to hold back expansion plans and some may relocate their operations out of Singapore. While the labour market remains tight, that is, Singaporeans can easily find jobs at all levels, Mr Lee said this will only push wages up in the short term. He said it would be dangerous to assume complacently that wages can continue to rise indefinitely just by squeezing on foreign workers. Mr Lee explained that higher wages push up business costs, affect competitiveness and may cause inflation. Singapore hopes to turn the tide by raising the country's productivity to 2 to 3 percent each year over the next decade. Ms. Lee pointed out that this will require the effort of everyone, workers, employers and the government. He said workers should be adaptable and flexible, keen to reskill and willing to cross over to new growing industries. While companies, he said, must support this transformation, Ms. Lee said employers should look beyond short-term profits, treat employees as partners and invest in their development. Unions too, he said, must work hard to organise workers who need help in this uncertain environment. Productivity has been a running theme for the many Mayday messages this year. In fact, just on Sunday night, the government announced an additional funding of 70 million Sing dollars over the next three years for the inclusive growth program to help companies transform their businesses to increase productivity. All this to increase the wages of Singaporean workers. In world news, the UN Secretary General has delivered a landmark speech to Parliament in Myanmar in a show of support for the reformist government. He called on lawmakers to accelerate the pace of change and urged Western nations to drop more sanctions on the country. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon met with Myanmar President Thein Sein in the administrative capital Naypyida and promised the UN's full cooperation as the country moves forward. This is the UN Secretary General's third visit to the country, but the first since historic by-elections and sweeping reforms. Mr. Ban says that Myanmar should be supported on its path to change, but that there will be inevitable obstacles. In his speech to Parliament, the UN chief urged urged the international community to show more support and reward Myanmar for its reforms. I urge the international community to go even further in lifting, suspending or easing trade restrictions and other sanctions. Second, Myanmar needs a substantial increase in international development assistance as well as foreign direct investment. Mr. Bond maintained that one of the UN's main goals is to fully normalize all operations within the country. He cautioned, though, that political stability is key and flagged a few important milestones ahead. By 2014, Myanmar's chairmanship of ASEAN will raise expectations and responsibilities that come with regional leadership. By 2015, National elections will take place. A notable absence at the speech was democracy icon and opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi. She gave a press conference at her home in Yangon, saying that she'll join parliament after a week-long delay over an oath. It was a stumbling block for what had been a trouble-free return to the political process. <laughs> Uh, 
Things went on without her and her party, the National League for Democracy, and even a quick glance at the nearly full chamber showed who was the clear majority. Critics of the Myanmar government say that the electoral victory of Aung San Suu Kyi and her National League for Democracy won't make that big a difference in the parliament. You can see that on one side of the aisle are the elected representatives, while on the other side, the seats are strictly reserved for members of the military. The road may be long for Myanmar, but it seems too narrow to turn back. Anna Suyasaniel, Channel News Asia, Naypyidaw, Myanmar. Just ahead, the latest word on Chinese dissident Chen Guangcheng's movements after his dramatic escape from house arrest. And SMRT maintenance personnel indicate that they found unusual irregularities even before the second train breakdown last December. Welcome back. In some news just in, Malaysia's Prime Minister has announced a minimum wage for the private sector. It's set at 900 ringgit or about 370 Sing dollars for Peninsula Malaysia and 800 ringgit for East Malaysia. In a live TV speech this hour, Najib Razak said the aim is to help lower wage workers cope with the rising cost of living. About 3.2 million workers are expected to benefit. This, of course, comes ahead of an impending general election. Meanwhile, Malaysian daily The Star is reporting, quote, new evidence online, allegedly showing opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim instigating protesters at the Bursay 3.0 rally this past weekend. Now, this video purportedly shows Mr. Anwar pointing at Madeka Square and making a rolling gesture to his deputy, Azmin Ali. Mr. Azmin then apparently talks to an associate who proceeds to remove police barriers. The crowd surges forward, and that's when police respond with water cannon and tear gas. Mr. Anwar denies this, saying he was trying to get the crowd to disperse and signaling Mr. Azmin to negotiate with the police. And next, the latest word out of China on escaped rights activist Chen Guangchen. His friend and fellow dissident Hu Jia says Chen is in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing but is not seeking asylum. Instead, he wants the Chinese government to investigate how he was treated under house arrest and promised to protect him and his family. Indications are that he has met U.S. Ambassador Gary Locke. Now, the case could cause a serious diplomatic wrangle between China and the U.S. Where is blind Chinese activist Chen Guangcheng? That's the question hogging global headlines for the past week. Chen fled house arrest in Shandong province on April 22nd. Rumors are that he made it to safety in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. But the embassy and Washington have refused to confirm or deny this. The United States is walking a political tightrope over the potentially sensitive case. The president tries to balance our commitment to human rights, making sure that the people throughout the world have the ability to express themselves freely and openly, but also that we can continue to carry out our relationships with uh, key countries overseas. And China, uh, U.S. relations is very important, so uh, we're going to make sure that we do this in the appropriate way and that the appropriate balance is struck. Senior U.S. diplomat Kurt Campbell arrived in Beijing on Sunday, and the New York Times says it was for talks on Chen. The case also threatens to overshadow upcoming high-level talks between the U.S. and China in Beijing. Uh, Still, analysts believe the scale tips toward a quick resolution. They believe China's leaders will not want further disruptions to the once-in-a-decade leadership handover later this year. And still in China, Coca-Cola has been ordered to temporarily stop production at a bottling plant because of reported chlorine contamination. The plant is in northern Shanxi province. An investigation was launched after a company whistleblower tipped off the media. It seems water containing small amounts of chlorine accidentally flowed into water used for drinks during maintenance work. But Coca-Cola says the suspension of operations is not linked to safety issues and that the chlorine levels were still well below international standards 
standards for drinking water. And back home, a plan will be put into effect in Angmokyo Town Garden West this week to deal with the problem of stray dogs. They'll be rounded up and rehomed. The plan is a joint effort by N Parks and animal welfare groups, and if it's effective, it may be adopted in other areas as well. Over the past six months, residents in this area have filed over 30 complaints about stray dogs, saying they bark aggressively, howl at night, and even chase park users. They are normally in, in a pack, you know, in a few dogs at a time. Not very comfortable, but so far no attacks. About 10 of them, big and small. In the past, NPARC says it was challenging to capture and rehome stray dogs. Some of the contributing factors was this thick forested area, as well as residents coming out to feed the stray dogs. The solution? This 15 by 25 meter enclosure, which NPARC is hoping will lure the strays in with food. We have to cut off all the food source, so we'll be working closely with the Amokyo Town Council to make sure that they clear the beans, they secure the bean centres. And once we cut off the food source, I think uh, the chances will be much higher for us to lure the food to the enclosure to rehome the dogs. Dogs in the enclosure will then be transported to an animal welfare shelter. And after being sterilised and assessed to be well adjusted, the dog will be put up for adoption. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals will help end parks in finding a new home for the dogs, but adds it will not be easy. With our own fosterers already, uh, or our pool, uh, but they are used to taking care of little puppies and kittens. And I'm not sure with dogs out here, they might pose us a challenge, but we're willing to try. The animal welfare group says it will give the dogs adequate time and space to rehabilitate. The stray dogs management plan will be reviewed on a weekly basis. The public inquiry into last year's MRT breakdowns has entered its third week and today maintenance personnel took the stand. It seems unusual irregularities were found during preventive maintenance work before the second major disruption on the 17th of December. First, fresh scratch marks on the cover of the third rail, which was later found to have caused the disruption because it sagged. However, it's not clear if the part of the rail that was scratched was also the portion that sagged. Second, the mirror on a vehicle used to conduct checks on the third rail was discovered to have cracked. And again, it is not clear if this contributed to a loss of readings when the checks were being done before the train started running that day. 340 students have enrolled as the pioneer cohort at Singapore's fourth university, nearly half of them female. The Singapore University of Technology and Design, or SUTD, had received more than 4,000 applications. Apart from good grades, the hopefuls had to write essays and undergo interviews. The courses are developed by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, and classes start on the 8th of May. In sport just ahead, England's Football Association defies bookmakers and fans to make a surprise decision about the new national coach. And forget line dancing, this grandma shows she's not too old for the pole. In business news, SMRT has booked a 59% drop in fourth quarter earnings. Net profit for the three months ended in March came in at almost $14 million. The bottom line was dragged down by higher costs on repairs and maintenance, energy and staff. But revenue was up 12% to about $275 million. Capital Land's first quarter net earnings climbed 31% on year. Net profit came in at $133 million. Southeast Asia's largest property developer says its bottom line was boosted by higher revenue from projects in Singapore and Australia. Group revenue rose nearly 5% to $641 million. And here are the market numbers. England could have a new football coach within days and his name is Roy Hodgson. The English Football Association says Hodgson is the only man they've approached for the job. 
Both sides are holding talks tonight. But English media say the news has left supporters and players underwhelmed. Hodgson is the current West Brom boss and previously managed Liverpool and Inter Milan as well as several national teams. He's never won a major trophy. Many had tipped Tottenham manager Harry Redknapp to take over from Fabio Capello, who quit the England job in February. However, it could be a question of money. Hodgson, unlike Redknapp, won't have to be bought out of his existing team contract. And all eyes also on the city of Manchester tonight, where what's described as the most significant derby in recent history will play out in a few hours. Man City hosts Man United in a top-of-the-table clash that could determine the EPL title. Reigning champions United currently lead City by three points. But if City win the 163rd Manchester derby, they'll leapfrog their rivals with just two matches to go. Kickoff is at 3 a.m. Singapore time. And in the Spanish league, Barcelona thumped Rayo Vallecano to keep alive their slim hopes of defending their title. The players responded to coach Pep Guardiola's impending departure in style against the home side. At the heart of it was Lionel Messi. The Argentine scored the first and last goals of the 7-0 rout and had a hand in setting up four of the other goals. Alexis Sanchez scored Barca's second before Messi set up Seydou Keita, Thiago and a Pedro Brace. So a magnificent seven that keeps Barca seven points behind leaders Real Madrid with three games left. Table tennis next, and Singapore's Gao Ning has capped a dominant run to win the 2012 Chile Open. The 29-year-old beat Japan's Kazuhiro Chan in five sets in a tournament where he was never stretched to seven. It was Gao's third final and second title on the men's singles tour. But more significantly, it's his first final and title in almost five years, signaling a return to form just in time for the Olympics. Oh, Lee Tia Wei, meanwhile, also made the women's final but was beaten by South Korean veteran Kim Kyung Ah. In the NBA, Kobe Bryant scored a game high 31 points as the LA Lakers won their opening Western Conference playoff game. They beat the visiting Denver Nuggets 103 to 88, with Andrew Bynum also taking center stage. He tied a playoff record with 10 blocked shots and grabbed the Lakers' first triple double since 1991. In San Antonio, Tony Parker top scored for the Spurs with 28 points as they silenced the Utah Jazz 106-91. The Spurs now have the highest offensive output by any NBA team in this year's playoffs. And they too grab a 1-0 lead in the best of seven series. Well, in the Eastern Conference, the Boston Celtics are down 1-0 to the Atlanta Hawks. Celtics guard Rajon Rondo was ejected after losing his temper. Now, away from sport, it's been 100 years since the Titanic sank, but you may get to experience a successful voyage on it in your lifetime, because one man is going to build an exact replica, a high-tech one. That the ship will be constructed, other than from the technology, the bow line, uh, on the same plans as the original ship, as far as layouts go, room decor and finish. And, uh... Clive Palmer, one of Australia's richest men, is engaging a Chinese shipbuilder for what he's calling an unsinkable version of the luxury liner. Unlike its ill-fated predecessor, the Titanic II will run on diesel and have state-of-the-art technology to keep it on course. But like the original, its maiden voyage will be from England to New York. No budget has been set, but Mr. Palmer, a mining and tourism tycoon, has big plans. Many people have attempted to do it before, but have failed because they didn't have the buy-in of a shipyard and they didn't have the money to pay for it. We've got the money, we've got the shipyard. We're planning that when it's completed in 2016, it'll sail from Shanghai to London with an escort from the Chinese Navy. We'll be inviting the Royal Navy to escort her on its maiden voyage across to New York and the US Navy to give it an escort back to, back to London. Speaking of a new lease of life, our last story is about a woman in China who shows you can still be sexy at 60. Sun Feng Chin spends three nights a week perfecting her pole dancing. She picked it up after learning about it from the internet, but kept it a secret at first because she felt it carried some stigma. Now, though, she's been featured in the media as possibly China's oldest pole dancer. And her family is giving her their blessings. The granny is remarkably agile for someone who once had a back injury. And she says it makes her feel young again. This has been News 5 Tonight. Good night.